everybody, to Be Brave with Brandon Tatum. So, thank you. <laughs> For those of you that weren't in here earlier, I am Caleb Glenn. I'm the president at TPUSA at Michigan Tech, and we're very thankful to have so many excited faces in here getting ready to listen to Brandon Tatum. So without further ado, let's get this thing rolling. Uh, there you go. All right, I don't have to scream at everybody. How y'all doing? Is it interfering with this? I just want to first off say that I'm incredibly thankful and grateful to be here. Thank you to the Turning Point people and the administrators here who fought for me to be here. We shouldn't have to go through this in 2023 where when someone with a difference of opinion wants to come out and give a speech that we have to then try to fight our way through. That, that's not the way it should be. That's the way it is. But I'm very thankful that you guys fought for me to be here right now in this place. And I believe God has called us to do something special here. And I appreciate you guys. <laughs> now, I, I just want to set the record straight. And I know that there may be people that agree in the audience, that disagree in the audience. That's not my issue. I love every single person. I don't have any beef with anybody. If you're gay, straight, trans, it ain't none of my business. I don't care. You don't pay my bills. I don't pay your bills. That's, that's on you. But what I will say is that I have a right to have an opinion. And my opinion is derived from the Bible. And I would never protest and go out and say, gay people should get married. I don't, I don't have a dog in that fight, in my opinion. But if you ask me, I'm gonna tell you what I think. And I know that before I got here, some people were saying that Brandon is hateful and he's evil to the LGBTQ and all this stuff. I do not care. I got bigger fish to fry than me worry about who you sleeping with at night. And I have people who are, who are friends of mine who are gay. I don't agree with some of the things that they do, but I love them anyway. I love them. And if they ask me any questions about it, I'll tell them how I feel about it. Other than that, hey, I love you. I don't want, I don't want no beef with you. You have to take that up with the Lord. I ain't your God and I didn't write the Bible. And I want people to understand that. So the things that I say, this thing is echoing. All right, let me see if I can fix it. Wishful thinking. All right, let's. All right, there you go. All right, the devil thought he had me. But I just, want to, I just want to make sure I say that because I, I know that there's some people that think about that, man. I, I, and I think that's what we all should believe is that we should love one another. 
We should not be divided. We should not hate one another. It is the, I think people in power have this idea that we should be divided. If we actually sat around, you know, went and sat around at a table together with people who claim that they don't want me to be here, that claim that they don't agree with many people who are in the audience, and we just went through point by point, we would agree with most stuff. Most people want there to be a better country, want a better America. They want to get along. But it's the people that are in power, that are in our government system, that benefit from us being divided. They want to divide us by color. Raise your hand if you care about the skin color of somebody. I ain't nobody cares. It's just a little extra melanin. Some of y'all, you stay in the sun, sun too long, you're going to turn a, little, a couple shades darker. It's, it's irrelevant. Most of us do not care. I remember when I was a police officer and I went call to call, calls for service, put my life on the line for other people. I have never one time, they called me on the radio, 2011-7, can you go to this call? And I said, wait, 2011-7 dispatch, what color is this person? Are they gay or straight? I never said that, it doesn't matter. I have an interest in serving and protecting no matter what. And I, and I want us to understand that, remember that, and retain it in our consciousness. It doesn't matter what religious affiliation you have. That don't mean we have to hate each other. I just agree to disagree with you and we can move on from there. So one of the core missions that I have in being here is to encourage us to be unified, to encourage us to love one another. And sometimes you may get a little bit of tough love from B. Tatum. I may call you a hypocrite if you have been hypocritical. I may articulate that I believe that what you're saying is against the best interests of America. Drag queen story hour is not in the best interest of America or children in America. And I'll tell you to your face. And if you don't like it, you can disagree with me and we, and we can have a debate or an argument about it. But we don't have to hate each other to have that opinion. And I'll, st I'll start with that point too. I don't see, I don't know if somebody can help me figure this out. Maybe when we do Q and A, what is it about men dressing like women in a sexual manner, reading books to kids, that somehow makes school administrators happy. I don't understand. There is no correlation. That's a grown person's activity, is doing cross-dressing and whatever they call it, drag queen story. That's for grown people. Anybody that have ever been to a drag show, I haven't, but I know people that have, they would articulate it has nothing to do with children. And I would argue that they're pushing an agenda it's an agenda. Whether they want to say it or not, it's an agenda. And I believe, my opinion, is that the agenda is leading towards pedophilia. It started at one point and it has now moved. Love and let live and let live. I remember when it used to be that way. Okay, we'll let you live and you mind your own business. But now you got to accept the way I want to live. Now you being a Christian, you got to marry me because that's what I feel. Oh, then it start going downhill. Now you got to come somehow believe in my pronouns. What does that even mean? That's not even English language. They, them, that you're a singular person. That's what I learned. You're a singular person. It's okay if you want to have the pronoun. I don't care. Do you? You and your friends can say they, them, and she, shim, and cats, and all kind of stuff. You do whatever you want to do. But you don't have to force me to do it. I don't want to defy what I learned in school. I don't want to defy biology. In my opinion, based on what I've studied, what I know to be true, a man cannot become a woman and a woman cannot become a man. A woman can identify or try to uh, misappropriate the image of a man. And if you want to live your life like that, that's all good. Baby, have a good time. Enjoy your life. You only got one of them. But you don't have to try to make me somehow abide by a falsehood. Women, uh, men cannot be women. I don't care what, how low your skirt you put on, you don't become a woman all of a sudden. And this is what bothers me about the whole concept, is that people believe, and, I, and they, they you know, attribute fighting for women's rights, yet they're okay with men dressing up like a woman and taking over women's spaces. It makes no sense whatsoever for trans women or whatever you call trans women 
to be in female sports. It's okay to transition. Won't power to you. But you don't need to interfere in women's sports. Everybody on planet Earth knows that men biologically are stronger or faster. All you have to do is look at the records. Go look at the sprinting record. Who's the fastest man in the world? And then compare it to the fastest woman in the world. Ain't even close. Look at the powerlifting record. Show me a woman that squat 1,000 pounds, and I'll give you everything I own. It ain't happening. And it ain't because women are somehow bad, and men are gods, and women are peasants. It's just God made us different, and we should embrace those differences. That's the reason why we have different sports in the first place. You have men competing against men, women competing against women. And people, in my opinion, that decide to transition later in life and they go and compete against women, to me, that's disgraceful. I know for a fact that I can outlift probably every woman in this room. And I ain't lifted in a while, if you can tell, I'm getting a little fat. <laughs> I could outlift every woman in this room. Now, if somehow I said, you know what, my whole life I really wanted to be a woman. And I go transition. I already know I have an advantage. Why would I do women like that? I thought I loved women. I thought I cared about women. I wouldn't do them like that. I'll just sit this one out. And the solution to that problem, in my personal opinion, is that why don't we have trans category? Where if a person is trans, they can compete against other trans people. And we can make that category. There's, there's a rampant rate of people becoming trans all of a sudden. When I was in school, I never heard of a transgender person. I never heard of it when I was in high school. Not as people were just too scared to do it or they didn't have the technology. I don't know. I ain't heard of it. And now all of a sudden it's that way. Make a separate category. I think that's fair. You shouldn't say, hey, you can't play sports at all. Just make a separate category. And you can compete. It'll be fair competition. And we can move on from there. But let me go to some other points because I, when I came here, I said, man, I just want to rub their face in it a little bit. The people who have the audacity to not want to hear a difference of opinion. America is not a racist country. Raise your hand if you agree with me that America is not a racist country. I think most people did. All right, I agree. Some people didn't, which is fine. And there's nothing that y'all can do that's white in here that I can't do. I would challenge anybody, show me something that you can do that I can't do. People often say, and they love to go to police. They go, it's good. you can't drive down the street without getting killed. No, that, what? I'm st I ain't never been killed before. <laughs> and it's pretty simple how not to get killed. I don't even know about this is even a conversation to be had. I've been, I got pulled over just recently. I'm embarrassed. I was wrong. I was driving on the freeway going to Vegas. And I'm flying in my truck. And I passed the cop and I knew it was over, right? He started to pull out. I pulled over right away. He only got to chase me. He ain't got to drive an extra mile. I, you got me, brother. I knew I was cutting up from the beginning. He pulled me over. We had a conversation. Thank God he didn't arrest me. He gave me a ticket, and I went on by my business. And what did I tell him when I, when I got done with the traffic stop? Thank you for your service. You be safe out there. I ain't going to get killed just because I'm black. That's a myth. It's a lie. I ain't never been afraid of police. And I'll never teach my kid that. Teach my kid that you got to do something different because you're black. That's me creating a falsehood in the mind of my son. You ain't got to do nothing different. You just have common sense. Don't pull a gun on a cop in a traffic stop. It's really that simple. Don't fight the cop at a traffic stop. And if you didn't do nothing, then you shouldn't have a problem. Pull your registration out, give it to the police officer, and move on. But they want us to believe that there's some type of disparity and discrimination in policing. And it's not, I, I, I wore the uniform. There were, there's probably some nut, knuckleheads out there. Every profession, you go to the doctor's office, there's some nut job in there mad at you because you're Arabic or something, or you know, not Arabic, maybe, maybe because you speak Arabic. But they're mad because of whatever reason they have in, your, in their mind, they're mad at you. But you know, generally speaking, most of us don't care. Nobody's worried about that. And we should keep that retained in our consciousness. Was this country built on slavery? Raise your hand if you think this country was built on slavery. Raise your hand. You think it was? Okay. I disagree. I disagree. Not every person owned a slave. Am I right? Even in the South where slave was legalized. How many people owned slaves? You had to have money to own slaves. You had to own money. In the North, there was no slaves. 
This country wasn't built on slavery. It was a part of our foundation, but it wasn't built on slavery. People, I know, I guess people don't remember in the Civil, Civil War was fought, which side won? The side for slavery or the side against slavery? Okay, we, I think we, got, we know the answer. That's why, there's no, that's why I'm not a slave no more. But I want us to understand that. We don't have to live in this falsehood and this fake reality that somehow black people are disadvantaged in this country. It's not true. It's not true. I'm black. But to some, I'm not considered black because I don't tell the narrative. Black people did so many wonderful things in this country, even in the 30s. Did so many wonderful things. Booker T. Washington, all those guys came from slavery to create and do great things in this country. Black Wall Street in the, in the 1920s. Black Harlem. All of these places, supposedly at the height of, slave, of racism in this country, these black men and women did wonderful things. Can anybody name the first female millionaire in the history of this country? Does anybody know her name? Who got it? Blurt it out. Don't be scared. There it goes. Somebody got it. Madam C.J. Walker. Sarah Bree Love. First female millionaire out of anybody in this country's history. What color was she? She was black. Oh, they don't tell y'all that. Because we're supposed to be NASA. We did. No. There were black people that were doing very good. Who was the first legal slave owner in, in slavery history in this country? Who, who was the first legal slave owner? Does anybody know his name? Nobody know his name? Anthony Johnson. Have you ever heard of Anthony Johnson? What color do you think Anthony Johnson is? He's black. Go look it up. Don't believe me. I noticed some people. Raise your hand if you, if you think I'm lying. Raise your hand. I don't, I'm not going to get hurt. I'm not feeling going to get hurt. Anthony Johnson, first legal slave owner United, in our history of slavery in this country, was a black man. Go look it up. They got his stuff plastered everywhere. But they won't tell y'all that in school because they needed to be the white man. Let me t talk about this. Everybody know, I'm, I'm assuming that most people know Juneteenth, right? The story behind Juneteenth in Galveston, Texas, when the last remnant of black slaves were set free. Is that the story that y'all heard? Raise your hand if you heard the story that way. Do you understand that that's not true? The last remnant of slaves that were owned were continued to be owned a year after Juneteenth by the Choctaw Indian. Choctaw Indians were the last to release the remnants of slaves. Oh, they don't tell you that, do they? They don't want you to know that Indians own slaves, own black slaves as well. Far before American slaves, far reaching in number of slave ownership was Northern Africa owned white people. People in Northern Africa were owned white slaves. Do you know where the word slave come from? Slavic. The Slavic people were enslaved. And that name slave came from the Slavic people who were the example of slavery. Oh, they don't want to tell you that because they want us to be divided. Hundreds of black people own hundreds of black slaves during slavery. I got another one for you. Harriet Tubman. I know we all heard about Harriet Tubman. What a wonderful, beautiful hero she was. Did you know that Harriet Tubman uh, was married when she started the Underground Railroad? Raise your hand if you knew she was married. Raise your hand if you knew that Harriet Tubman actually lived with her husband, who was a free black man. Raise your hand if you knew that. And raise your hand if you knew that her husband told her not to do it. And he would forever go down in history as a coward. But her husband said, don't do it. She was married, living with her husband, who was a free black man, when she started the Underground Railroad. Now, I want you to put this in perspective. Who do you think helped Harriet Tubman in the Underground Railroad? It was white people. She wasn't going to black people's houses and escaping to the north to La La Land. She was going to the north where black people were free. And white people helped them all along the way. Good white people, I think I may say black people, good white people who never believed in slavery, believed that it was wrong, it was an ill, it was a sin, always helped black people escape slavery and become free. We've always worked together from the very beginning of time to do great things in this country. How did I, you could say me, if I associate myself back in my lineage, 
How did I become free? I mean, not a slave. White people, we didn't vote. You know, we didn't have the right to vote. Some good white people, I would argue, gave us the right of freedom from slavery, became citizens, got the right to vote. All of those were good white people who did what was right. Civil War, hundreds of thousands of white people died, and their death gave freedom to black people in this country. All of the black people that run around and say, this is, I hate this country, I ain't never done nothing for me, why they live here then? Where else they gonna live? You, you, hey, nowadays, you get on a plane and you can get up out of here if you want to. Why they won't leave? Because this is the greatest country on earth. This is the greatest country for anybody. To be black, to be white, to be poor, I would argue, this is the greatest country. Go to other countries of poor people. They ain't got uh, uh, Obama phones. Poor people in our country get iPhones and stuff, free. I remember when I would arrest people, almost everybody I arrested had an Obama phone. I'm like, how you get a cell phone, you ain't got a job? You, 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 you only have a house, but you got a cell phone. The poorest amongst us have free health care. Can you believe that? I would get upset, and, and, I, and I, I believe that it's right to help out people. Don't get me wrong. But I would get upset. Everybody I, I arrested out here smoking drugs and doing crime and, 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 and destroying communities, they had free health care. They'll go and get bludgeoned and drunk and get to the, and get to the hospital, spend a $30,000 on their medical bill, and they don't give a flying flip. The poorest amongst us have ample amount of services and resources compared to the rest of the world. We live in the greatest country on planet Earth. And I want us to understand that, retain it in our consciousness. And I want to, I want to talk about redlining real quick because I had to study this. How many of you guys would argue that you're familiar with redlining, meaning that you know every aspect of it. Raise your hand. Yeah, see, I was the same way. I know, I, I, I was like, okay, the argument is that redlining just destroyed black people. And after listening to the left-wing media and left-wing pundits and these fake black leaders, I question everything they say now. I question everything. After Black Lives Matter, <laughs> I question everything now. They forced people to put that black square on their social media and can somebody and I'll wait to Q&A what has Black Lives Matter done for anybody let alone black folks what is they what have they done have the condition of black people according to them have they gotten any better no have the wealth of black people gotten any better since Black Lives Matter no you go down and name it Black Lives Matter was nothing but a money grab Billions of dollars given to that nonprofit organization. How many dollars you think went to George Floyd's family? Zero. How many dollars went to Ahmaud Arbery's family? Zero. I go down the list. They didn't give money to hardly any of these families. None. Zero. What did Patrice Cullors do with that money? She went and bought her a mansion, a few of them. Where'd she buy that? She buy it in the inner cities? No, she bought it where, where nothing but white people but they're supposed to be about black lives. These people are frauds, and they defrauded America. They burned down buildings, caused all this chaos, and in my opinion, based on all the things that I've seen, have had no results but division and hatred and chaos. Do black lives matter? Yeah, of course, of course they do. I don't know a single person that say, black people don't matter. <laughs> Everybody matters. Everybody matters, not just black people. Everybody have struggles, not just black people. You know, they talk about this white privilege. It's bull crap. I want to cuss, but I'm a Christian. It's bull crap. See, white people, this is what they want you to believe. Somehow a white person come out, wah, 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 and they give them a card. Hey, you don't have no struggles in life right here. When you want to go to school, it's free. Your daddy, he get laid off? Okay, you got money right there. That's the stupidest thing in the world. White people don't have no more benefit than me. When I was growing up, we had friends, Dustin and Derek, they were poor. They didn't have a daddy. They used to take our, our hand-me-down clothes. I guess, they, I guess their uh, white privilege car got declined. You think people got to work? White people don't have to not work. You got to work. You got to feed your family. 
you know, it's, it's, a bunch of, it's a bunch of bull crap. White privilege. I think that's the most racist concept I've ever heard in my life. Because as a black man, you're telling me that you're better than me. That's what I hear. Because I ask anybody, wait till we go to Q&A. Somebody going to disagree with me. What benefits do you have that I don't have? They got to get racist after that. <laughs> well, I'm going to go to school. Well, you think I'm not as smart as you? Think I can't make a 4.0 GPA? You, you think I can't do that? You racist. That's what you are. Oh, you can't get a job like me. Oh, you think I'm not qualified like you are? You think I don't have the hustle? I don't have the grind to get a job? Are you crazy? Black people can't vote because they don't have IDs. You think I'm dumb enough not to have an ID? <laughs> you are racist. They all, that's what they say. Well, you can't get pulled over by a police. You think I don't know how to act and behave myself and conduct myself? You think I can't start a business? I own a few businesses. You think, you think when I fill out that application to do that business or I have my attorneys do, build one of my businesses, my energy drink company, you think they said, well, he's black. Well, he can't, we can't represent him. No, it's, it's all bull crap, man. Don't fall for it. Don't fall for it. It's all designed to make us hate each other. It's all designed. And when we talk about this, even in the political realm, people have political interest in saying certain things that may not be true, both sides. I ain't here to simp for the Republicans either. The Republicans, some of them are crooked. Democrats are more crooked, in my opinion. That's my opinion. You can have your own opinion. When you're running around telling people the, the wealthy need to pay their fair share, you are a crook, in my opinion. You know why? Because go ahead and raise corporate tax. You think these companies don't know how to finagle their way out of paying as much tax as the mom and pop business? You must be crazy. They got a whole team of lawyers that know what to do. They know how to put money here and put money there, invest money here. They know how to leverage debt to pay the least amount of taxes. When they raise the taxes, they raise it on an everyday American. That's what they're doing. You think when they raise personal tax, you think, you think, you think Elon Musk, unless he feel like it, you think Elon Musk is gonna, pay, gonna be dumb enough to pay as much taxes as us? No, he's not. They were like, Elon don't pay any taxes. Elon's wealth was in his shares that he owned in Tesla. If he don't draw, there's no capital gain tax. He don't have to pay tax on that wealth. He can leverage the bank to give him money on the wealth that he has without spending a single dollar. And it's all debt to him and he don't have to pay any taxes. Now, of course, he pulled out billions of dollars and he throw the money a couple billion dollars because he don't care. He's so rich. But you think that raising taxes is going to help? No, it's not. The economist Thomas Sowell articulate this very clearly. And this is kind of like the Republicans aligned too. When they lower taxes, the Treasury gets more tax revenue. And when they raise taxes, it's less. Why? Because people are less likely to pay taxes when you, when you have all these hurdles to climb. When you're, people defraud taxes. They do all of these things when taxes are too high. When taxes are low, people are more willing to acquiesce to the laws that are reasonable and they end up paying more taxes. But they, the people know this and they lie to you because they don't really love you. They don't really care about you. They have a vested interest to say what they wanna say. DeSantis is banning books. You think, do you think, like this is my thing, do you really think DeSantis is banning books because he hate black people? Did y'all see the books? I'm, how many of you guys saw the interview that DeSantis did where they, they ended up banning the video, they had to cut the feed on the television. It was too graphic. Did y'all see that thing with Ron DeSantis? A few people did. They had to cut the feed because the graphic nature of the books that are in elementary schools were too graphic for television. They only had 26% of the school districts actually participated in giving the numbers to the governor. And 26% of the school districts they had 175 books that were removed from schools. 155 of them were deemed pornography. I just did a video today, a father, the stuff that he was saying to the council, to the school board was horrific. Couldn't even repeat it. I had to blur it out on my channel because it was too much. They're putting those books in the schools. People get mad at CRT and they go, CRT is right. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I don't want my son to learn CRT. 
CRT is built, first of all, CRT is supposed to be college level, graduate level um, theory. It's not supposed to be articulated in schools where kids cannot understand the complexity of the uh, critical race theory. It's not a fact, it's a theory. But they put it in schools and they pit kids against each other. They want the black kids to feel like they're victims and they want the white kids to feel like they're their oppressor. That's not how you teach history. They're revising history. And, and, and I'm telling you, they have a political agenda. What's happening with Trump right now? In my opinion, unless there's facts, is a political agenda. Remember the Russia thing? He was with Russia, Russia, Russia collusion. Wasted taxpayer dollar to investigate a nothing burger. Go down the list. Ukraine, he got impeached over Ukraine call. Zelensky, now, now we love him now, everybody. Now we're giving all our money to Ukraine. Back then, they didn't even believe what he said. He said, me and Donald Trump had a perfect call. There was nothing wrong. Oh, no, he must be simping for Trump. And now we're giving him billions of dollars. And this is just my theory. You know why we're giving him billions and billions and billions of dollars? Because the Biden, in my opinion, the Biden's got vested interests in Ukraine. They ain't done stuff with Ukraine, Ukrainian government. Hunter Biden, his dealings with, with Burisma, all of this stuff. These politicians are dirty as a mother. And they coming out here and, and trying to sell you a, a nightmare. But anyway, I could talk forever about these things. But I want us to be encouraged to learn the truth. And don't be afraid to stand up for what you believe. And I keep, this, this, this event is gonna forever be something that, that's close to my heart. Because you guys fought, especially the Turning Point staff, fought that I can be here. Can you believe there's people out here that don't, didn't want me here? Yeah, you can give a round of applause. <laughs> they didn't want me here because I hurt somebody's feelings. I don't care about your feelings. I care about facts. I hope that you guys understand this. Most of y'all college age people, you're in college. Your feelings don't matter as much as facts do. When I have constructive criticism, people come to me, B. Tatum, you're doing your business wrong, man. You shouldn't do this. It hurt my feelings because I think I know it all. I think I'm the boss. I hired a COO just recently and he told me, you, you, you're taking way too long in this meeting. You're wasting time. I almost, I was like, what? I'm going to fire you today. <laughs> hey, it kind of hurt my feelings a little bit. You're trying to tell me I, I'm the man here. But you know what a mature adult says that, okay, maybe my feelings, my, my, my feelings may be hurt by what he said. I may be a little bit offended by what he said, but was it true? That's the way I have grown and I have learned everything that I've learned. It hurt my feelings, but is it true? I used to not always be conservative or at least know that I was. Larry Elder hurt my feelings. <laughs> he started saying all that truth. I, I was feeling some type of way. Oh, no, he can't be right. Dudes on the police department hurt my feelings because I was all over Barack Obama. That was my dog. Smart. He was black, even though he ain't black. How do you mean he's not black? What, what part? Hold on, hold on. No, no, no. How do you mean Barack Obama's not black? How is he black? Give me an example. Give me his, father, his father's black. So that makes him black? Yeah. What about his mama? His mother's white. So that makes him black? Sit down real quick. Let me school you real quick. Okay. okay. Is white supremacy, are you a white supremacist? No. Is white supremacy that says that a black man and a white woman together make a black kid? That's that is the purest idea of white supremacy. No, no, that's, no, it's not. Are you crying? Are you going to cry? Please sit down. Please sit down. Because white, suprem white supremacy says that. That's why you hold the truth of that. No, my son, listen, listen, listen. Don't talk over me, please. Thank you. That's right. That's right. You're talking over a black man. Come on. With all, with all due respect, okay? With all due respect. Barack Obama isn't black because he have a drop of black in him. My kids, my kids are not black. My wife is white. I'm black. They're biracial. They're not black. See, what happened in history is that if a black, if a black man or a white man or any other race had a drop of anything else, and it, 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 it eliminated them from being pure white. 
It was called a one drop rule. If a white person had a baby with a black person, they did not want the white race to not be pure, so you defaulted to the other race. Today, they practice the same thing. What makes my son black? He is 50-50. He's half white, half black. There's no way that you call him black unless you want the white race to be pure. And I think that's what that is. 50-50 genes. That boy is 50-50. He don't have to walk around and say he's black. He don't have to walk around and say he's white. He's biracial. And it bothers me when people still hold that racist ideology. If a white person have a baby with a Hispanic person, that person is Hispanic. Why is that? Because the white race needs to be pure. It cannot have any fault. It cannot have any uh, uh, mixing. They used to call it back in the day race mixing. That's why we have racism today in some capacities is because of that very reason. They want us to be divided. And, and, and it bothers me. They stand up at your event and they scream at you as if they have the moral authority. The United States is not racist. But it's, it's not. Okay, how's it racist? How's it racist? Just real quick. Oh, okay, cool. No, I, I, I want to get on the camera. Or, or, uh, what color? What, what's your race? I'm biracial. <laughs> what does that mean? You just said that you're that you okay. biracial. What's your, what's your mix? I'm Hispanic. And what? And white. Okay, so you, you go by white? I go by mixed. So why is Obama black then? Well, I mean, I'm also Hispanic. I'm white and Hispanic. There's multitudes. But you're mixed. You're not just Hispanic. Let, let, let's get back. Would you be the first Hispanic whatever? Uh, I mean, I, if you feel like it. What's or whatever. So are you Hispanic? Can we get back to the... No, no. Will you qualify for a minority benefits? So you said that the United... Would you qualify for minority benefits? So you... No, because I'm not... I, I, no. Why not? Okay. You're Hispanic. So you said that the United States is not a racist country. However, the dominant social order imposes that white has to be pure, which you acknowledge comes from the United States. But you are not, perpetuating that, not me. Not a, but we're not a racist country, like you said. Do you believe there's things in this country you can do that I can't do? Yes. Name it. Um, statistically, if... No, 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 no. Stati you can do that I can't do. Oh, well, then nothing. However, we kind of are dealing with lots of numbers and people. Uh, if we were both owning houses in a similar neighborhood and I tried to sell my house and you tried to sell your house, my house would statistically be valued higher than yours. That's a theory. Because I have lighter skin than you. What house you because I have lighter skin than you. How big is your house? I don't... Well, I'm sorry? How big is your house? I have no comments on that. That's not important. That's a non sequitur. It's not. Is your house bigger than mine? If we had similar houses in a similar neighborhood and we both tried to sell our houses, statistically, my house would be valued higher than yours because you have darker skin than me. According to who? I'm, I'm sorry? According to who? Uh, I, the skin color? If you, so if you, if, you had, if you were working at a bank and you were giving out loans, would you give out a loan to a white man and not a black man? That's what redlining is. You donuts. All right, let me explain redlining. Let me explain redlining for you guys. I was trying to make a point there. It was kind of comical. However, let me, this is a really good book for you to read as well. Thomas Sowell wrote a book called Discrimination and Disparities, right? Just because there's disparity don't necessarily mean that there's discrimination. I can go down the list. Do you think that school districts are discriminating against men? No, they're not. Women just decide to work in schools more so than men do. Do you think that the NFL is discriminating against white men? No, it isn't. Just so happened that black people athleticism plays a role in black people playing in sports in the NFL. That does not mean because there's a disparity that there's discrimination. Now redlining, I did my research on redlining. There is no unequivocal proof that the reason why loans were given or not given is just because people were black. So in theory, this is pretty much what it's supposed to be. That certain areas in our country, there was banks would not allow or they would not give certain loans to certain areas, right? Because of multitude of reasons. Whether, whether it's uh, a dangerous area, they wouldn't give mortgage, mortgages to dangerous areas, areas that are run down, all of the above. And just so happened in some of these areas, they were minority areas. Now, people take that and say, it's the banks were racist. But if you look at the institutions, the bank institutions, if they had higher qualifications or unrealistic qualifications for black people, unlike white people, then you would see that the, um, the rate of not being able to pay your loan, right? 
if you, if you the defaulting on your loan and different things like that, you will see it being higher amongst whites and not blacks if they had extra qualifications for blacks. And that's not what happened. Now, I don't know if it was racist or not. I don't believe that it was because I don't believe there's a correlation. Look at the black banks and look at the white banks. Black banks rejected black people at the same rate or higher than white banks did. Where's the correlation? You know, where's the, the outcry on that? And so moving forward, the idea from one side says that they only did this because they were black. On another side, they had ramifications for people not taking care of their communities, not having good credit and, and the like. So you have the two factions that have a difference of opinion. And you, you, you go to move forward and you say, how does redlining affect black people today? You know, I grew up in a black neighborhood and many people who talk about this subject have never lived in a black neighborhood. It's not about redlining that I saw or anything that had anything to do with the government, the reason why black communities were suffering so much. It was culture and personal responsibility. Nobody, no government, no law, makes people have children out of wedlock. That's a personal decision. There's no law that makes you not graduate from high school. That's a personal decision. There's no government law that thrusts you into selling drugs in your community. That's a personal decision. Unfortunately, black people, in my opinion, in these inner cities have adopted this culture that's destructive. And this has really no relevance. Now, let me give you an example of how I think that the overcorrection of what they call redlining, and this is what they do every time, caused the crash of the market. Because in, I guess, protests to redlining, they now gave non-discriminate loans to people who did not qualify. And what happened? We had a whole crash of the system. Black people were not defaulting on their loans at a higher rate than we've ever seen in history. And that's because they focus on race and we should be focusing on results. If you don't have a high credit score, you should not be able to get a particular loan. There's a lot of other things that are factored into this. Larry Elder wrote a really good piece. Tommy Sowell obviously wrote a really good piece. They both are very similar in their thought process here. They don't, they don't answer a lot of questions that go along with the behaviors of different people. Right? They go, well, they give loans to white people at a, higher, at a better interest rate than they give to black people. What they don't ask the question of is that, are they equal in their financial situation? If you look at statistical data, white people have 30% more savings than black people do. When you go to get a loan, if you know anything about loans, they look at how much liquid funds you have. They look at what you have in your savings. They look at how much money you make. And then you have to negotiate. Are black people negotiating to get a better interest rate? or they just taking the first thing that they get. All of these things are questions that need to be answered before you articulate that redlining is the problem and the banks are discriminated against black folks. All of these questions are not answered. It's just because there's this disparity, people articulate that there's discrimination. The same situation happens in law enforcement. If you look at it, you can ask a person like the person sitting on the front row. You ask a person, do black people get killed by police more than white people. Percentage-wise or per capita? Or I, I get, raw numbers? Get raw numbers. Uh, raw numbers, no, because this country is only 13% black. Okay, how many, let's go with the murder rate. How many, what percentage of murders that occur in this country are, are perpetuated by black people? Uh, a small number. You gotta do your research. Go do your research. Go do your research. Over half of all murders committed in this country are committed by black men, primarily. When you look at the statistical data of police shootings, more white people are shot unarmed than black people are, twice as many. All you gotta do is go to the Washington Post. They have a, they have a, uh, um, a database that they've kept, and I don't, I'm, I'm kinda iffy on it, but at least you can go and look it up. They have a database of every shooting that has occurred in the United States from 2015 all the way up to present. And you can go and look at any statistical data. Twice as many white people are shot unarmed than black people twice as many white people are killed by police over black people. Now they say there's more white people than black people. I just gave you a crime statistic. statistic. Over half of, of the murders and over half of all violent crimes are perpetuated by black people, unfortunately. So police patrol and police activity and engagement are at a much higher rate in inner city black communities than they are in white communities. Now if you add those numbers together, do your research, you add them together, you can come back and, and chastise me on this if I'm wrong. If you add the numbers together, actually white people are shot at a disproportionate rate than black people given the response and police activity in white communities. They don't want to tell you that. They don't want you to think that. 
show me the last person that you've seen shot an arm white that made the news. I, I, you, there's none. Although they get shot more. Anybody know who Tony Temple is? Anybody know Tony Temple? Raise your hand, I gotta see. One. How many people know who Tony Temple is? Okay, I see one person. Do you remember, how many people know who George Floyd is? Raise your hand. So much for racism in this country. Tony Temple was murdered in a very similar way as George Floyd. I think it was worse. Go look up Tony Temple and look up his death. He asked for help. He was having a mental crisis. Police showed up and they knelt on him until he died. And then they made fun of him while he was dying. They laughed at him. They mocked him. They made fun of him. It was, it was one of the, the worst police interactions that I've seen, knowing that that man died. And those cops just stood there and, and heckled him while he took his last breath. You will never see it on television because it doesn't fit the narrative. I think George Floyd was a horrible, that was a horrible situation. I hope Chauvin go to prison. He, de he deserves it. As a former police officer, I'd have never kneeled on a person like that. At some point, you got to get up. At some point, you got to play the game. The man saying he can't breathe, roll him over, all right, all right, back on him. If that's, what, if that's what's necessary to keep, to keep him restrained. But it was a horrible act by police. But Tony Temple would never get the same justice as a black man getting killed by a police officer. But we live in a racist country. You know, it's funny because as a black man, there are loans that are afforded to black people that are not afforded to white people. If I'm certified as a black owned business, there's opportunities that my business get that your business won't get. They don't have a white owned business benefit in America. It don't exist. They don't have affirmative action for white people in America. It really doesn't exist. But yet we're a racist country. We, I would argue, the wealthiest black people in the world live in America. Black people who actually know what's going on, who are not spoiled brats, living off of falsehoods, they die to make it here. How many black and brown people come through the southern border? They will die to be here. How many black people are waiting in lines in Africa, dying for the opportunity to be here in America? Yet we're a racist country. It makes no sense. It's brainwashing. Black people all over the world know how great it is to be free if they can only get here. Why is it that black people who um, are immigrants here from other countries do better than black Americans? I thought because you're black, you, don't, you can't do that well. No, it's called culture. And how do I know about culture? I grew up in the culture. See, you may not know this. You may, you may not know this. When I was going to school, if you put your, wore your pants like this, you're trying to act white. When I was going to school, you made straight A's, you're trying to be white. You ain't cool enough. You'll get made fun of, you'll get bullied. How do you know, Mr. Tate? Because I used to bully people on the same premise. You know who was the most exciting person and the coolest person in our neighborhood? The dope boy. The guy selling drugs in our community. My little brother right here, he doing a film. He know what I'm talking about. The dope dealer was the one that we love. The dope dealer was the one that we supported. It hurt my feelings to see what's really going on in the black community, but out in the world, they, tell, they selling a dream. I remember I used to get my car washed and the crackhead used to wash my car and I never thought twice, of, twice about it. You give him $5, he'll do your whole car, inside and out, $5. Until I saw the man smoke the crack when I'm driving around the back of the car wash. I saw him smoke crack for the first time. And I felt broken inside, thinking that I'm feeding drugs to my own people. How many white people selling drugs to black people in the hood? None. Zero. We selling drugs to our own people. I'll give you another stat. The history of lynching in this country, 68 years of, of the history of lynching, recorded history. There was about 3,200 black people that were lynched in this country. White people were lynched as well. I think about 1,200. 3,200 black people were lynched, recorded in the history of this country. You know, in a six month period, young black men are killed by other black men at, at, that, at the same rate as the entire legacy of lynching in this country. You understand that? About 6,000 black men kill black men every single year. That's, that's, but but the, it's the white man's fault. When I was growing up, I wasn't afraid of white people. I didn't like white people, I'm just being honest. That was told to me, I was brought up like that. But I wasn't afraid of white people, I was afraid of black people. Because you go down on Lil John and you got the wrong colors on, somebody will kill you. And nobody will snitch on it. I wasn't afraid of that. My own people. 
I had family members selling drugs and family members using drugs. And I saw a family member sell drugs to my other family member. With my own eyes. But yet it's the white man. I never seen a white person in my community except on a football team coaching at an all black school. There wasn't no white people in our community doing drive-by shootings. There wasn't no white people running in our school fighting and, and, and stabbing and pulling guns on people. It was nothing but black people. And the reason I say this is because you guys may not have an opportunity to hear somebody keep it real. It's, it's, it's such a lie, but we can change it. We can do better if we are transparent about what's happening instead of talking, doing talking points. They always talk about redlining and stuff. Is that the pro That's not the problem. Most black people that I grew up in don't know what a red line is. It's culture. How many, how many uh, um, country music singers have been shot and killed? Name one. I can name five of the most prominent rappers murdered in cold blood in front of everybody. Tupac Shakur and Biggie were the two most famous people in America and murdered. Nipsey Hussle in, in California, giving back to his community, building the community, murdered right in front of his store in broad daylight. The guy kicked him and shot and killed him. They in the same game. Young Dolph, one of the biggest celebrity black rappers, murdered broad daylight, giving back to his community. It's another guy, DNA or P P and B. I think about peanut butter. Is it P and B? P and B Rock. P and B Rock at Roscoe Chicken and Waffles with his girl. She texts his location. Dudes came and robbed and killed him. Wasn't no black people. I mean, wasn't no white people. It's our own people. People got to stop doing these talking points. I knew when I was growing up, you can't take a white girl home. You can bring a white girl home. You're crazy. But white people are racist. Come on. I know, I know what it is. I grew up, I've been black my whole life. <laughs> but people that are not informed, that have not lived a the life, they just can say what they, they know that's been spoken to them. These things can change if we be transparent, if we be honest. This country could come together if we stop dividing with bull crap and these fake statistics and out of context statistics. It can come together if we love one another. I believe if you put God first, we, all of this stuff will be better. I'm going to say this last thing and I'm going to open it for Q&A. I think I'm right on the time. I do a three-hour radio show every day, so y'all, I can talk. I honestly believe that. I'm going to give you my five principles that I use with my business. I tell every business meeting. I tell, I tell my people this. First thing is to put God first. Everything you do. And I know there's some people in here that may or may not believe in God, man, but like, when you think about B. Tatum and you think about all that I've been through, where I've come from, and I could tell my story and that'd be another three hours. But where I came from, used to have gold teeth in my mouth. Y'all can't even imagine that, right? I used to sag my pants. I used to wear tall tees. Go look on the internet. You'll find the pictures. I got young savage tattooed across my stomach right here. I got tats on my leg. My arms are filled with tats. I got my hood tattooed on my forearms. Eastwood, Texas. I wasn't always like this. And God saved me. And so everything that I do, I put God first. I try to do everything in love and put God first. And then the second thing that, that I have on the agenda of my five pillars that I tell my people is integrity. You got to have integrity. You got to do the right thing when nobody's watching. So many people bite the bullet, man. Their talent can take them somewhere that their integrity can't hold. All you young people in here, remember that. Whatever you do in the dark will come to light. Have integrity. Be, you don't have to live in a, a double life. Just be who you really are. And do the right thing and you'll you you activate so much change in the world. Be loyal. I tell, I tell my people I'm loyal to them. All the people that work for me, I pay them well, full, full benefits. And man, that, 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 uh, that payroll taxes eat me alive. <laughs> but I pay payroll tax and I do that because I love the people that work for me. I'm loyal to them, they're loyal to me. You know, my executive assistant, she, sometimes she babysit my kids because she, cause she's about the mission. She loved me because she know I'll take care of her. All my people, I take care of them. Be loyal to one another. Be loyal to your friends. Be loyal to your parents. Have some pride. Everything that you do is a reflection of the people around you. Remember that.
when you go out and act a fool, it's not just you. You go out and do something embarrassing, it's not just you. You're embarrassing your family. One thing I tell my son is that you have a family name, son. That name Tatum means something. And that's the reason why I go out and do what I do, because my son got to carry that name. When somebody talk about Tatum, they look at my son, they know that his daddy is doing it. His daddy is a good man. And my son had to carry that legacy. And then fight is the fourth one. Fight. We're in a fight. There ain't nothing that has been had or nothing that has been gained without fighting for it. There's nobody that's successful that I know of. And I know dudes that make millions, hundreds of millions. I know one guy that he managed billions of dollars. Private jets and everything. None of them tell a story of how it was handed to them. They had to fight for it. Rights in this country, for women, for men, for freedom, somebody died for that. Somebody fought for that. And it makes me upset when people look, in, look at this country and don't appreciate the sacrifice that was made. Some 18-year-old, 19-year-old, 20-year-old boy that had his life in front of him, that loved his family too, that had big dreams, went to a foreign country, and died. Can you imagine that? Some of y'all won't even go across the street because it's too cold. Went to a foreign country, took his last breath. I think about it every time and I get emotional. And he thought, I'm never coming home. My parents are never gonna see me again. But you know what? They're gonna be free. Can you imagine that? You gotta fight for what you want. You got to fight to be successful. There may be adversity that come in your life. Adversity is just to make you better. If you punk out when adversity come, you ain't never going to make it nowhere. You have to look at adversity as God challenging you to take you to the next level. You got to fight for what you want in this life. And my last principle, I tell them, I say, you got to win. <laughs> You ain't fighting just to be fighting. There ain't no participation trophies in life. I don't know, no matter what they tell you, I don't know how they teach up in here. There ain't no participation trophies. Ain't no, just because you white, you finna somehow get a, you, no, that ain't true. There's a lot of poor white people in this country. You don't just get it just because you feel like it. You gotta, your, your fight is to win. And winning means something different for every single person in here. When it may be you just getting past the semester. When it could be you just doing better than your parents did, making your parents proud. When it could be stopping an addiction that you have, taking the first foot forward. When it can be going to the gym. That's how I win. I go to the gym, man, I've been getting fat. My wife say, oh, you got a dad bod. I say, oh, no, God, help me. I'm too young to have a dad bod. But winning to me is getting up and taking one step at a time and saying, okay, I'm going to get in the gym today. I ain't got to worry about the end result. I just need to get in there, take a step forward. So those are the five principles that I tell my people, and I'm going to leave them with you. Practice them every day. And if you forget everything I said, just put God first. Put God first. All right, I think I'm ready for the Q&A. Thank you. You're welcome to ask more questions if you have them. <laughs> Thank you, Brandon. All right, so how we're going to do this Q&A is I'm going to call out, uh, I believe there's 10 names here that uh, put up, put their information in for questions. And then after that, it's first come, first serve to the line. So when I call your name, you're going to stand up, you're going to walk towards this wall over here, and you're, I'm going to be standing down at the bottom with this microphone, which I will be holding and you will be speaking into to ask the question. All right? <laughs> You, can, you messed that up. I don't know what's wrong with y'all. <laughs> All right, so Andrew Stoddinger. Sorry if I pronounce these wrong. Uh, Rachel Passino, Joshua Uris, Daniel Brannigan, Lance Jose, Bailey Simington, Cooper Evans, Ethan S., and Christian Harrison. And then once we get all these people up here, uh, the rest of you can... File behind them. And I'll try to make it quick. I'll try to do the best I can. No Get long-winded sometimes. <laughs> All right, Andrew? All right, sweet. All right, first up, Andrew, go ahead with your question. 
How do you feel about Democrats using tactics like talking about uh, critical race theory, intersectionality, uh, just stuff like that to kind of keep black Americans in victimhood? Uh, I think I think your question, I think we heard it very clear. I'm, I'm trying to do that for the audio, but um, I think that is disingenuous at best. Right. I mean, I don't think that there's is a need to push that. I don't need to, I don't think there's a need to divide. And I don't think a lot of these people are genuine in their approach to do any of these things. I think that they just want political leverage. If you feel like you're a victim or you're in fear and all this stuff, you're going to pull a lever for somebody. That's why black America been pulling a lever for the Democrat Party for so long. And, and I don't I, and I used to I used to vote Democrat. So I, at one point, I didn't know why. Now I know why it's, it's fear. If you feel like that this country is not made for you, you want people to fix it. And they've been talking about fixing it forever. That's like being married to somebody and they're like, I'm going to make your life better. And your wife's doing like this. Boop, 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 boop. <laughs> You're like, well, you ain't doing what you promised me. And I think that they need to keep that leverage going. And, and this is just an indication real quick on why I think that they perpetuate these things for leverage. Remember the last presidential election, they were speaking Spanish. Do you know how stupid that is? If a person don't understand English and they're watching a debate, they're probably watching Telemundo, which is already translated into Spanish. But if you're speaking Spanish to somebody and you really want to convey the message, you only spoke three words in Spanish and they didn't understand nothing else you said. It's pandering. It's pandering that they're doing and I wish that both sides would stop. Do what's in the best interest of the people and that's to unite people, not to divide. Uh, hello, um, so my question, I watch your videos a lot. Um, Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so the erasure of women, how do you think that will, um, do you think it will get worse in sports and how do you think it will impact job opportunities? I know I'm in STEM and um, do you think it's monetary? That's Wait, can, you, can you repeat that first part? You said the erase, erasing women or? Erasure of women in sports. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, of course I do. You know, think about it. Have you ever seen a, a, a man or a woman that turned into a man dominate sports? Have you ever seen it? No, we're not even having a conversation about that. It's that you see men who are transitioning to women who have a biological difference and they're competing in sports unfairly. It's a clear example, Leah Thomas. Leah Thomas, we have the record of Leah Thomas competing against men. And there's a, a specific time that Leo Thomas hit when he was competing against men. He turned over to be a woman. Everybody knows that he's going to dominate the women. Even if you take estrogen or you, or you, you take hormones or different things like that, you lose a, a little percentage of your strength, but you're not going to lose all of it. It's almost like somebody taking steroids for 25 years and they get off steroids and be like, no, I'm back to normal. No, you're not. You got years and years of years of building muscle density, muscle mass, lung capacity, all those things biologically that you have. And, and, and I say that it's not right, and it's going to rob women of opportunity if they allow it to continue. And the reason I say that is because the opportunity to go to college are the, the best performing women in the sport. And you give it about 20 years at the rate in which we see transgenderism in sports, you're going to have the top two or three women will be biological men who transition to, to, to living their life as a woman. And that's scholarships that are going to be missed. That's endorsements that are going to be missed. And some people may take advantage of it. Just think about this for a minute. And I want people to contemplate this. I think that I give my hat off and I have a lot of respect for people who actually transition, meaning that they, they go through the life, they do the hormones, they've done the therapy, they literally are trying to live the life as the other gender. The people that switch overnight, I have zero respect for that person. That's not fair. Money making opportunities amongst us. If the only qualification that you have is that you identify, self-identify self -identify as a woman, brother, if I can go and compete in the WNBA, I can just fake it a little bit and I can go dominate and I'll get so many endorsements and so much money. And then I go off to my life and transition back. Who gonna tell me I can't transition back? I changed my mind. I, I'm not saying it happened today, right? It's still new, but it will happen in 20 years. And can you blame them? Can you blame a man for switching and having a world record and getting money and endorsements? I think it's a very stark difference, in my opinion, between a person who's trying to live as the opposite sex. And they, it's not easy. I couldn't imagine, bro. I couldn't imagine, you know, wearing a dress and people humiliate you and all this other stuff. But at the same time, it's like you went through it and the other person didn't. That's not the same. Anyway, I hope that now your question.
There's a second part. Do you think it's motivated by money? And you kind of answered that a little bit. Yeah, I think it's motivated by money. Some people it's not. It's just motivated by greed. I think Leo Thomas is greedy. I think I think Leo Thomas is motivated by, you know, trying to have the title in swimming and doing things like that. I don't think it's motivated by anything else. Now, I don't know that person, so I don't know. It could be, maybe they're genuine. Um, I was wondering if you had a response to those on the right who have stopped supporting police officers and back in the blue for their participation in unconstitutional uh, COVID mandates and uh, anti-Second Amendment uh, legislation. Perfect. Love that, love that question. Great question. Um, I'm very disappointed in people who, because just like I, I ring the left over this all the time, it's like, understand the laws. Like, I think people, somebody made a video and I made a counter video and people got mad at me. They were saying it was the police officer in New York at the pizza parlor. They said those cops arrested that kid for no reason and they're doing this. And it's like, slow down a minute. Look at the laws and look at what actually happened. Those police officers never touched that kid, never arrested that kid. Um, and they weren't enforcing um, mask mandates. They weren't enforcing that. They're enforcing trespassing. And so I want people to, to kind of settle down a little bit and don't be so quick to jump ship on police officers. Now, if you're doing something that's unconstitutional, meaning you're enforcing something that's not in the Constitution or in the law, then you should be, you should be criticized over that. But I think we need to slow down. Look, first responders are doing the job. It's a very tough job. And what do you do when the law says if a person refused to leave an establishment for whatever reason that you have to then force them to leave based on trespassing laws? What is a police officer supposed to do? Say, you know what? I don't agree with that law. I don't agree with the reason y'all said for this occasion, I'm not going to do anything. Cops can't do that. That's not fair for them to do it. And they have to do their job. But it's a difference between violating people's constitutional rights and doing things that we don't we don't agree with that are already letters of the law. So I, I wish that conservatives would do their research just like I tell the liber liberals to do it. If it's a person violating constitutional rights, ring them, put them on social media, blast them, talk about them. If that's not the case, then make sure you're accurately portraying it. Um, so my question is like, what can conservatives, especially on campus, do to combat cancel culture? Because obviously we live, we live in a culture where people on the left are so confident and so, so like outgoing, you know, they're even willing to stand up and shout at someone in their own convention. And you, you don't see people on the right doing that. We don't have, we don't have any social power, it feels like. Well, I, I agree with you. I think it's, it's called conservatives have decorum and respect for other people. I would never get up and shout at somebody at their event. I'll get in line and ask them questions when it's time to ask questions. I think that's the difference between the left and the right. They're disrespectful, they're arrogant at times, and I think it, it rubs people the wrong way. It's not beneficial for life because you can't just stand up and yell at your job like that at your boss because you will get fired. You know, So this is not a, a good translation of real life when you don't do things that are conducive. I think that conservatives, gotta do, you gotta stand up more. You know, when they're doing stuff, like just like now, they want to protest this event. If a p couple of people were out here protesting the event, counter protest. You know, they go and teach Marxism on campus, call them what they are. Call them what they are socialists, racists, Marxists. They hate America, they hate God. Call them for what they are. Don't be afraid to stand in their face and tell them the truth. I love that, that uh, Turning Point USA does things on campus with the uh, you know, tabling and stuff like that. Be, be firm at your table. Keep doing it. Keep inviting people to come speak. Keep pushing through. Don't ever let anybody tell you you're a racist if you ain't a racist. Now, if you're a racist, put the shoe on. But if you ain't a racist, don't let them call, call them back for what they are. These people are cowards, many of them. So call them out. Challenge them on their points. And, and, and never back down. And if they get loud, you get loud too. But what I will say is that remain um, focused on being a respectful individual and a human being. Because at the end of the day, are you being respectful? Or are you doing what's right? And if you are, it'll work out. What do you think is the biggest problem facing our country and how do we solve it? Great question. And I think I have a great answer. I think, the, I think the biggest problem with our country is the lack of God. I think that people do not retain God in their consciousness. And I'll say it's not, that's easy. <laughs> the biggest problem is the lack of retention of God in our consciousness. This country is lacking God in a tremendous way. And the church is a big problem, I think. What are they teaching in the church? They teaching peanut, they teaching cookies and cream stuff. We need to be on the meat of the word of God. 
We should be firm. I'll say this. Where are the pastors at? When, when, when they're teaching, when they got pornographic uh, um, books in our kids' schools, when they got drag queen story hour, where are the pastors at? Saying that this enough is enough. When they're trying to force pastors to marry two men together, where, where are the pastors at saying enough is enough? We, we're not gonna, we're not gonna bow down to the mob. We're gonna believe in the scripture. There are pastors that are a part of the problem. A pastor saying that they are pro-abortion. You know how stupid that is? There you go, the mic talking back. You know how, you know how crazy that is? For a pastor to be pro-abortion? You are an idiot. You are not following God. And so, to be honest, the church have a, a large responsibility to actually preach the gospel. There's liberation in the gospel. Not coddling and trying to mix sauces and be on halfway on the fence. There's no, there's no liberation in that. And, and, and I think that our country lacks that, and I think if we re regain that, that's one element that can make our country better. The second thing is that we need to stop being divided. Quit being so gullible. These t Listen, it's a money thing with the media. Fox News going to say what Fox News needs to say to get them ratings. That's how they get paid. CNN, they are lie, cheating still to get money to pay for their programming. These, you, you, take this stuff with a grain of salt. Take, take me with a grain of salt. Listen to what I say and go and research. Do your own stuff. The fact that we don't do that and we just sheep following whoever we like and all this stuff, this is why we get confused on COVID-19. This is why we get confused on the, on the Fauci ouchie. That's why we don't know what's going on half of the time. That's why we hate each other. We really think race is a real thing. You know, we all came from the same place. <laughs> we all came from the same place. The only difference is some of us ended up in different parts of the world. You're close to the equator. Of course, you're going to get more sun. The body's going to develop more melanin. Of course, you're going to begin to evolve and have bigger noses so your, so your brain can be cooled by the air because it's hotter. When you go further from a hot climate, the nose is skinnier, it's thinner. It doesn't need that much air into the brain. All of these things, we evolve to match our environment. God made us that way. We ain't, we the same person. I, you know, I ain't gonna say, I ain't stabbing nobody. But if somehow you were to cut yourself and you bleed, we all bleeding blood. It's the same thing. We all have the same organs on the inside. We all have a heart, we all love, we all have compassion. Some people are crazier than others, but we're all one. And if we can stop buying into this bull crap that they're selling us, I think we'll be a better country. So this is uh, kind of related to what you said last time uh, about like median ratings. And uh, my question is, is back in like 2008 to around 2012, uh, there was a lot of like Occupy Wall Street, a lot of that stuff. And it kind of went away and it was kind of replaced by I feel like a lot of feminism, racism, all that type of stuff. And you were saying about um, media wanting ratings and all that stuff. So my question to you is, do you think, because the big corporations bought it back then in 2008 after the crash, do you think that it's replaced it so that it can divide us further? And also, will you play me in a game of chess? <laughs> oh, I would, you would drag me through the mud in a game of chess for real. I've never played chess, so. And you're probably smarter than me. You look smarter than me. Um, but to answer your question, I think 100%. If it bleeds, it leads. You know, I'm telling you, like, look at all the wonderful things that go on in this country. Look at all the police officers that save people's lives. I mean, literally, it happens every day. I've saved multiple people's lives with, you know, putting my own life on the line. It'll never get any coverage on the news. You'll never know. All you think is cops shoot and kill people. You know, to be honest, like, it's rare that a cop have to shoot somebody. You know, I was a police officer. I was on a SWAT team. I was in the most dangerous, one of the most dangerous cities in Arizona, and I never shot anybody. I pulled my gun out a lot but I've never shot anybody. Most of the people I work with never shot anybody. Our chief had 30 years on the police department in Tucson and never shot anybody. But the media makes you think that. You know, think about this, let's just put it in perspective. The 14 unarmed black men were shot, you know, on average every year. That's 40 million black people. Do you know how small of a percentage that is? Like, but they make it seem like every day a, a black man is getting shot and killed. Police officers have millions of interactions with people on a day-to-day, -day, but millions all over the country. And it rarely result in a violent crime. I think like 20 something hundred people get killed by police every year. There's 300 some million people in this country. You know, so the media, they're made to exacerbate things. Donald Trump comes out and says, hey man, I'm getting arrested. All they cover is the arrest. They, they're gonna cover it till the cows come home. It can all be made up. I mean, to be honest, I don't know what they're gonna do. The DA came out and said he was a fraud, but he came out and said he was gonna do it, but they may or may not do it. 
but the media is going to cover it because it's going to sensationalized. You know, so I think that they have a vested interest. We got to understand the game, man. It's a money thing. If they don't get you to look at the camera, they don't get you to look at the TV, they can't sell these advertisements. And if they can't sell the advertisement, they don't make no money, they close down. So they have a vested interest in pushing division. They have a vested interest in talking about CRT and racism and, you know, they, it's, it's crazy to me, man. I wish that we can overcome it. I think that we will if we keep having conversations. Uh, so also, like you said it was ratings, I think it is absolutely that, but also do you think it's like because corporations bought it, do you think it's them trying to like get them to stop us from focusing on Occupy Wall Street and more like oh. us dividing on each other? It could be. <laughs> it could be. The government is crooked as a mother, man. I mean, look at history. I mean, we've been crooked all these other countries too. I ain't gonna even lie, man. Look, we do it better than everybody else, but you know, we, it, the, the government is crooked. I wouldn't be shocked. Look at Big Pharma. I mean, think about what they're doing. There they want you to take a pill that leads you to take another pill to take a pill to take a pill. Why would they make a, why would they make a cure for something when I mean, they can make trillions of dollars off of you? Of course they want you to get the COVID-19 shot. And I'll say this in front of everybody. I don't care if you want to get it, get it. Don't make me get it. But, it, you know, more power to you. People come to me all the time. I got the shot. Good. I'm happy. And you die, don't get mad at me. Stuff start twitching like this. Don't get mad at me. I tried to, I tried to warn you, but I do think that the government has a vested interest to look away from government corruption. Our government is corrupt. Imagine if you had a guy running your money and he like, oh, I just want to let you know you like two billion dollars in debt. He like, well, wait a minute, you fired, brother. We got trillions of dollars of debt in our country, and these fools are on, in Congress arguing with each other about stupid stuff. They, I, they need to get together. Listen. When the GDP goes down, I heard Warren Buffett say this. That's the way you can get politicians to act right. When the GDP goes down, then none of the people who are in political power have, have the right to be reelected. How many times, you, how, how much do you think that they're going to make sure that GDP goes up? What's the vested interest that they will have in our country? They don't, man. I will tell you, there's only a few politicians, mostly on the Republican side, maybe a few on the Democrat side. There's only a few that actually care about the country and actually want to do something. The rest of them, they drink beers, man. They, they drinking beer hanging out after they do their whole session. You think they mad at each other. They not mad at each other. They cool. They playing the game. That's almost like why every other election is a Republican, Democrat, Republican, Democrat. They all in the same bed together. Donald Trump was the only one that came out and said, man, I'm not sleeping with y'all. I don't need your money. I'm going to mess it up. And they hate him because of it. And I'm not saying I like everything Trump does. He get on my nerves half of the time. I'm like, why did you tweet that, man? You was doing good. <laughs> my daddy, I almost voted for you. <laughs> but at the same time, real recognize real. I see what they're doing. Hi, Brandon. Uh, since the level of policing um, knowledge and expertise varies by state by state and even by city by city in some places, uh, would a implementation of a nationwide policing standard improve the overall policing in uh, some areas that have lower standards than others? I think that's an incredible question. I would, I would lean on the side of saying no. I don't think that federalized anything is good because different communities need different things, right? The federal government can't legislate everybody and make sure it's all an equal standard because some people probably need more than that standard. So I think that it should be state by state basis, but I do think that there needs to be accountability held by law enforcement in each state. Like the governor, the mayors, they need to be holding law enforcement accountable. There needs to be funding to law enforcement. You know, they, they, the whole defund of police movement, you, it's the stupidest thing I ever heard. What's her name? I forget her name, Cori Bush or one of these frauds. Defund the police, they, we don't need the cops in our community. She $500,000 worth of security. Can you believe that? They got bodyguards all around them, but you don't need security. Your kid's getting killed and the police don't show up for two or three minutes. And, and, and they want to defund the police. So what, what I'm, to go back to the point, I think that there needs to be a standard statewide, right? Statewide policing, like if you say you have a problem with racism in, in, your, in your police force or something like that, racial bias, you may need to do more about fixing that and eradicating that. Some states don't have that issue whatsoever. And they don't need to have to waste their time taking a course about inclusion and diversity and stuff like that. It just, it'll be a waste of time. And then also, 
you don't want people managing from the federal level because it turns into a dictatorship. Because the president that's in there, if they have the House or the Senate, they're going to control what the whole country does. And then they, what I think they're really trying to do is create a federal police. They want to get rid of local policing. They want it all controlled on the federal level. And I think that's the reason why the left is so against police officers, and because it, it makes no sense for them to do that. But I do think that there should be a mandate. I think police officers should be held accountable. They should be held to the highest standard, and they need support to do that. We got time for two more questions. These are the last two questions here. Hi, Brandon. Uh, I've been watching you since you were on Timcast and during the swatting and all that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but um, anyways, uh, I want to know, what would you say to a young college student who is afraid of losing their good friends over some of their political beliefs and wants to remain friends with them? Well, I'll tell you this. Great question. Great question. Hey, they ain't your friends <laughs> if they're willing to leave you over a political disagreement. You need new friends. You know, because at the end of the day, a friend isn't just a person who hang around you all the time. A friend is somebody who loves you, who appreciates you, who respects you. One of my best friends played football together. We did dirt together. We got saved together. We, we didn't agree politically at all. You know, he was all Black Lives Matter. And I'm like, oh, my God. But, I love, but we love each other. And so I don't care what he feel. I, don't, I mean, I don't care what he's politically where he's staying because we still boys, no matter what. It go to, you know, somebody, it's some fighting go on. I got your back. So if you get to a point where somebody's willing to turn their back on you because they disagree with you politically, that person ain't your friend. And you need new friends. And in my personal opinion, anybody in here dealing with this, God will send you people that are really loyal to you and people that really care about you. When I came out and I became a conservative, oh my God, people at my church, <laughs> Sister Sia, I'll never forget Sister Sia. She's, she, she the woman, I mean y'all grew up in a, like a Pentecostal apostolic church. Have you seen it on TV? At least seen it. They speak in tongues and they do all that. And she be the one in there. Jesus, I don't know, that's tongues, tongues, tongues. She all on the floor. What the Lord says. She doing all of that. She all deep into it. She found out I supported Trump and she called me the N-word and everything. She said, you ain't nothing but an N just like me. I'm like, sister, see her. <laughs> and so people came out against me. People I went to school with, they were my boys. They were my dogs, man. They online, be telling them an Uncle Tom, coon, sellout, working for the white man. You know, a little bit, it hurt a little bit. But after a while, I started to realize that, no, y'all ain't real. God sent me a whole bunch of more people. Oh, that's, that, that sentence wasn't right. He sent me more people, a whole bunch of more in, in, in English language. <laughs> but he sent me a lot more people that loved and respect me. And like my, the group of friends that I have right now, are like the greatest friends ever. So don't be afraid to move on, man. God is taking you to another place, and some of these people can't go with you. Hey, Brandon. Uh, thank you so much for coming here and speaking to all of us tonight. I really appreciate what you had to say, and I also appreciate um, this person in the front row, although I don't know your name, for standing up. I mean, you got a lot of fire and energy in you, and I, I appreciate that as well, just because you... I thought you had great points and you got good discussion in that and I really appreciate that. I think we should give yeah. this person a round of applause. I don't wanna I don't wanna you know, assume your gender or nothing. So yeah, just appreciate the bravery and you standing up for what you believe in. I mean that's what makes what I think this country great. Uh, we can have these diverse opinions. Uh, my question for you is, is I'm going to be going off soon. I'm graduating, going to a different community. Uh, and I know you say, take God with me in this, but what's the best way for me to go about trying to serve my community in the future? And what would you do to recommend about just even where to get started in helping people? Because that's really what you were bringing to this event is what you're kind of going for is helping people. So how would you recommend going about doing that? Yeah, I think it's a, a tremendous question. I think it's great. You got to have God. The God is not just a weekend thing. God is not just a little Bible that you have on the table and your pastor telling you scriptures. The, the, having, retaining God and having a relationship with God is a personal thing. So that means God should be able to go with you anywhere you go, anytime. Even when you're doing what you ain't supposed to be doing, God is right there with you. But you need to have God. You need to keep God in the forefront. Get involved in organizations and churches that are doing it. That's the easiest way to do it. There's no reason to recreate the wheel. You may be in a place where there's a church there that's functioning in the community. Always be there to serve. Everything you do in life 
is for service. Everything I do is to serve other people. I become successful because I serve. It's not about me. It's about somebody else. Even when I think about God called me, I'm like, God, don't, don't. I, I don't want it to be about me. I want you to use me to bless other people. And so you have the right mindset when you go get plugged in where people are doing it. Um, if not, if there's simple things that you can do, man. You don't, have to, you don't have to somehow revolutionize a million people at one time. I mean, just being nice every day to somebody. When I go to the coffee place, I pay for the person behind me. Every time I go to the, the coffee place down the street from my headquarters. When I see people, I'm nice to them. Hey, how you doing? Having a good day. God bless you. There was a trans person at the at the um, at the bur at the uh, taco place that I go to. That I, I'm still nice. How you doing? Great. Are you having a good night? Have a have a wonderful night. Thank you so much. Give them a tip. Be nice to people. That's how you serve every day. It doesn't have to be on a massive scale. It don't have to be some great awakening. People don't even have to know about it. But every day you wake up. You look at every person that you engage with as an opportunity to serve that person, either by having a smile on your face, by saying something positive to them, by working your butt off at your job. If you're working on a job, you're an entrepreneur. You, that's the way you serve every day. Everything you do is service. You know, do your best. I always remember that. I know young people, sometimes y'all be cutting up. But y'all y'all in this room, y'all perfect. I'm talking about somebody in another lecture. <laughs> But sometimes it's hard to like see that because you feel like it, it got to be all super spiritual. It's like when you go into class, that's service. Do the best you can. Be an example. Make your teacher happy. You know, don't be in there causing problems. Be in there doing well. Do well for your parents. Make them proud of you. Every day, serve and you'll be better. And I, and I think that's what you can do and I know that you'll do it. All right, let's give it up for Brandon. Woo! All right, so we're going to try to get a picture. We're going to try to get a picture. So how we're going to do this, everybody stand up. If you're on this side, you're going to go to this wall and then file in up on the platform. And if you're on this side, you're going to file out to this wall and file up this side of the platform. Brandon, if you wouldn't mind, okay. stand in the middle here. Thank you for talking to me. Yeah. All right, also, um, let's see here. Could I get some volunteers from my volunteer group in the middle there to help me organize this? Nora, Braden, Maruta, that's you. All right. <laughs> yeah, you can, Brandon right there. All right, start filing in, start filing in, start filing in. Once you two meet, all right, now split off. Now go in front of them. So keep it coming, keep it coming. See kind of what we're doing here, what we're trying to get done? Second row, line them up. Yeah, just kind of shuffle them in, multiple rows. Okay, Jordan, get over here. Good, stay in line. Next row, good, good. <laughs> You're good right in the, You're good right in the middle there. All right, new, new line, new line, new line. New line, follow him. Awesome. Kind of stop here. Another row. Keep her coming. We're going to run out of room. <laughs> yeah. What? Are you really good? Uh, I didn't have it up there. No, it's up at the front. All right. Yeah. Keep her coming. All right, you guys can line up along the, starting there, line up along in front on the stage. Almost there. <laughs> awesome. 
Do you feel like you're too far to the left? Feel free to just – you could come across here. All right. We good? <laughs> Quit death. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, this is awesome. All right, yeah, just kind of. Water. <laughs> 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 Not beer. <laughs>